So welcome to this, this event. As, uh, it's a joint, a joint venture uh, between the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series, CCLS, and CESA, the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. Uh, the Cambridge Climate Lecture Series began uh, uh, two or three years ago in memory of David Mackay, who was a, a leading light in the um, uh, sustainable energy world. Um, he died tragically young, but we remember him uh, uh, for the great work that he did, and we're trying to continue that work. The uh, Centre for the Study of Existential Risk uh, is uh, relatively uh, uh, well established now. I, it's, uh, it was established about five years or so ago in, in Cambridge. Um, and um, uh, our visitor this evening, Joris van der Schott, if I've got that roughly right, oh, pretty good. Um, is from the Netherlands but is currently uh, living in Switzerland and is an, is an engineer by background. Uh, and we, uh, we thought we'd have a discussion tonight about energy and what we're going to do, uh, what we might do to, um, to, to fix things. So um, the, uh, the, the, the theme of the Cambridge uh, Climate Lecture Series this year is um, climate change, can we fix it? Um, and oh now I'm sorry I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Hugh Hunt, and I am an engineer myself in the uh, in the Department of Engineering, and I'm a fellow of Trinity College here in Cambridge. So as one engineer to another, um, I hope we'll have a good conversation. You started uh, your career in the fossil fuel industry. You worked for Shell. Uh, yes, uh, I did. Um and, and I, uh, I'm very grateful to Shell for, uh, for a very interesting uh, uh, career, and I, I'm sure we'll, we'll touch a little bit upon that. Um, but I think tonight the, the, the question that we're, we'll be addressing is whether there are any fundamentally new clean energy sources out there. Whether it's worth even asking the question, and if so, whether we're, as a global community, actually looking for answers. Because the oil age will, with sufficient hindsight, just be a, a, a blimp on the history of mankind. Right? And the question is, what are we transitioning to? And that's what I hope to uh, address in tonight's talk about the Miracle Energy Prize. So you say that the, 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 the so oil, coal and gas will, will be seen as, a, as a, a blip in the, you know, when we get through all of this. Do you think that's the way that Shell and ExxonMobil and so on see the, uh, the current predicament? Um, well, not, not with the same speed and, and I suppose that's, that's part of why I at some point uh, decided to, uh, to, to part ways with the oil industry. Uh, but I do think these companies are playing a very important role in, in society today and I think that's what originally attracted me to um, the energy industry, which is the fact that energy is something so essential to um, our planet. Um, I think there was this uh, Harvard professor, uh, Richard Wrangham, who said he's a primatologist. Uh, and he said he considers life itself as basically a, a quest for energy. Mm. And, and then he goes on to advance the, the hypothesis that um, perhaps what, what made us truly human was the fact that we learned how to control fire, i.e. we created as the only species on Earth this external metabolism, burning calories outside of our own bodies. And, and what began small with, with campfires, you know, has, has grown over the 20th century to what is today a, I, I call it a Niagara of oil sometimes, right? If you, if you look at um, all the energy that the world uses um, and you convert it into barrels of oil equivalent as you do at the um, International Energy Agency in Paris, uh, you find a flow rate that's 
pretty similar to the flow rate of the American Falls at Niagara. Mm. And um, I, I use that image because I'm very bad at remembering the numbers. And even if I remember the number, I'll forget the unit. So if, if you can picture a Niagara of oil, you've got a good sense of the scale of the world energy system today. So the, it's a good way of thinking. You know, we, we, we've harnessed energy. We've, we've created this external supply of energy, first through burning wood and so on, but now we burn fossil fuels. Uh, and, well, we're going to have to slow, slow that down. But we've been very inventive over the, the last couple of centuries at how we burn the fossil fuels. We look at the extraordinary technologies now that we have for, for burning oil, coal and gas efficiently, cleanly, um, relentlessly. Um, we've got to wind that down and at the same time wind up energy uh, technologies that are equally imaginative, equally efficient, equally uh, um, uh, productive. And what you're interested in is, well, maybe we have wind turbines which are getting more and more efficient and, and, and quieter and so on. We've got solar panels which are getting better. We've, we've hydropower as well established. But these don't seem to be uh, enough to fill the gap of what we need um, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, what, what, why do you think that these aren't going to fill the gap? I mean, that's, why do we need something special, something new? Yes, um, so, so I think you, you, you see this link um, throughout history, um, relatively modern history, between economic growth and energy use growth. Right. We, we saw it here in the UK with the Industrial Revolution and the use of, of coal. Um, if, if I may just uh, cite the Dutch, uh, who had their golden century before the English, using another fossil fuel, which is uh, not very widely known, uh, peat. Mm. And we were one of the few countries where you could effectively transport the peat from where you can win it to where you need it through the canals that you still see in Amsterdam and, and, and you know, all through the Netherlands today. Um, and, and what you see in the world today is, yes, we're living on this Niagara of oil and we know we have to change, so we're moving to cleaner energy. But at the same time, our energy system is growing. So even though we're adding a lot of um, clean renewables, um, we're not actually closing down the polluting mm -hmm. um, power plants. And so our CO2 emissions keep rising. They haven't peaked yet, despite all the efforts that, we, that we're currently putting into the, the, the rollout of renewables. Well, uh, and that, that is likely to continue for some time. And, and I think that's, to come back to the oil industry, I, I think that's why, yes, companies in the, in the traditional energy industry aren't that worried because today if you look at that Niagara of oil less than two percent comes from wind and solar. All wind and solar combined has, has delivered less than two percent of the global energy demand and, and the growth to a hundred percent is going to be decades not years. But isn't part of the, the uh the difficulty for the growth of renewable energies, uh, portability, in that we can, put, we can put oil into our planes, into our ships and into our cars, and we can have oil in our mining equipment in remote parts, but can we, how can we create portable energy, transportable energy sources? Mm. Um, uh, yeah, no, I don't a think a wind turbine is always going to be a fixed thing. A, a, a nuclear power station will be a fixed thing. A, a hydroelectric plant is fixed. Yeah, so, so in, in, in addition to um, the, the source of energy, uh, there's also the storage of energy, especially for mobile applications, as you say. So you're, you're quite right that even when we make that full transition to, to renewables, uh, it's not yet certain whether we will enjoy the same scope and the same quality of energy as we're enjoying from fossil fuels today. 
There's a reason why you don't see um, solar-powered planes, and, and I'm excluding uh, the one exception that did the, um, you know, the, the, the trip around the world, um, which is hanging in the um, Cité des Sciences in Paris. So we were there a few weeks ago. But, but that has a size of a, of a Boeing, a wingspan of a Boeing. And how many passengers? Uh, one. Well, just a pilot. And so, I, I think hmm. it did something like 40 kilometers per hour or something. So for, for those types of applications, yes, you, you need a more hmm. compact energy source. Um, I think w w when I think about the, the energy transition, people often evoke the... Um, that Moore's law, mm. right? And, and they say, yes, well, you know, we're, we're not so far, but this is, has been growing exponentially, so it, it will continue to grow exponentially. And, and I think that is a flaw in, mm. in, in thinking because Moore's law about the number of transistors on a microchip was a law of downscaling, right? With, with, with a fixed amount of material resources, you just do more and more because you're, you're etching more and more integrated circuits. Um, the, um, the transition to clean energy is going to require upscaling. If you want twice as much solar power, you have to build twice as many solar power, uh, mm. panels and, and cover twice as much land. There are marginal improvements, but, but, but nothing close to doubling every so many years. And, and that is going to require a very large amount of resources in terms of um, industrial capacity, capital, and ultimately time. And, and that is time that we, we do perhaps not have. So the, the idea of creating new energy sources, you kind of think of them as miracle energy sources, ones we haven't thought of yet. Um, well, perhaps some of them we've thought of but we haven't got them quite right, like batteries, for instance. I mean, is there a, a battery on the horizon that might have a hundred times, a thousand times the energy density of present batteries? And then there will be people who will say, oh, you know, there's a fundamental physical principle that says that won't be the case. Or can we, can we generate um, fusion energy out of out of water, cold water, and then there are people out there saying, oh no, that'll never happen. Um, all these things that we say will never happen. Um, well, can we say for sure that they'll never happen or do we need the right, the right people to, to, to come up with good ideas? Yeah, so on, on, the, um, on the subject of batteries, I'm, I'm not particularly an expert uh, uh, on that field, but uh, I think fundamentally, you could imagine that you can get exponentially better as you've gotten exponentially better with, with the microchips, right? It's kind of the same thing. As, as long as you keep adding more energy per unit of mass. Um, now, at some point, you will, you will reach limits on that, but, but maybe you find ways around those limits. Um, so, so, so there's not a fundamental thing that, that I see that could, could block that, um, unlike the scaling up of the energy source, which is going to require the materials that, that, that I mentioned. Um, but indeed, there are perhaps opportunities outside of the um, types of energy that we're considering today, um, which might be worth investigating. And that's what this prize is all about. So um, does the prize, this X prize that you've been talking about for miracle energy, can you explain a little bit about what your vision is and how, how this might come to be? It doesn't sure. exist quite yet. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's an initiative. It's a, it's a project for the moment. Um, there, there's been some pre-work uh, done, but, it, but it's nowhere near uh, launching tomorrow, so to speak. Um, yes, so maybe it's good if I uh, first talk a little bit about um, you know, miracle energy, because uh, to some, that might, may sound a bit um, odd. Um, the term is actually from Bill Gates, who used it on one of his blogs. Um, uh, Mr. Gates is very interested in, uh, in, in energy and, and has a lot of other philanthropic 
uh, ventures as well, but also invest in, in clean energy. And I think when he said it, he was really looking for breakthroughs in energy. But what is a breakthrough to one may not be a breakthrough to, to another person. Um, for me, the term miracle, uh, I, I use that because I think it ac accurately describes the type of energy that we're looking for. Um, we, we have daily breakthroughs in our lives. Even paradigm shifts are starting to be um, you know, something you read about every day. I think a miracle captures the fact that these are energy sources that, that are probably beyond the boundary of today's accepted science. Right? So discoveries that will challenge us in what we believe we know about the way nature works. And, and that is a bit of a long shot, to be honest. Right? It's, I think if you ask anyone, especially if you ask any scientist, whether it's likely that you'll find anything beyond the boundary of, of currently known science, then, then the answer is, is probably no. But at the same time, we've had scientific breakthroughs in the past. right? We have discovered new things about science. Uh, that, that's um, just part of the process. And I think we also, almost everybody buys into the fact that 100 years from now, we'll, you know, that boundary of accepted science will have moved. Right? Because we're, we're working, we're doing scientific research all the time, and new theories or new experiments you know, challenge the, the, the established science all the time. And some of them get accepted over time, and most of them get rejected. And I think where the prize comes in is to say, well, if, if you accept that fundamental premise uh, that, that science you know, will move over time, let's imagine that it might move on the field of energy in particular, and let's imagine that it's tomorrow and not necessarily 100 years from now. Um, and maybe there are things that people are working on just beyond those boundaries um, that are actually quite near to becoming accepted science and which could make a big difference in our lives. Right? Well, so one of those technologies is cold fusion. I think that that would be a good candidate uh, and other candidates? I, I, I think there are, but the um, premise of a prize is that you set out a, a certain prize amount to attract the needles from the clean energy haystack, so to speak. So you don't have to go out and, and say, well, I'm going to you know, invest in some research in, in this area that I believe in or this other area that you, know, you happen to believe in or, or, or still other areas. No, what you do is you say, well, this is the type of technology that we're looking for and then attach a, a, a prize to that so that researchers from across the globe uh, will actually start working in that direction and try to meet the specifications that you set out in that prize. So what kind of specifications would you have? I mean, presumably you'd, you'd have to have something reasonably concrete. I mean, as, a, as an actual solution to energy, you can't kind of be too uh, science fiction. No, uh, no, I, I, I fully agree with you. So um, I, I am, like you, an, an engineer, and, and I do like to think I've got my two feet on the ground, so to speak. It's just having that open mind that something might be possible. Would you expect I, a piece of heart? So, I mean, we're talking a, a few million dollars for this prize, yeah, let's say. So, 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 so what it, do you have to do to get the prize? Do you have to right. produce some hardware or do you the, have to... The, the prize is meant uh, to recognize breakthrough energy innovators who can produce working prototypes of technology that taps into hitherto unexploited sources of energy that are clean and abundant. So it's not a prize for ideas. It is a prize for something that actually works. And would, to, I mean, to, uh, does it have to be, I mean, how big, I mean, if it was producing milliwatts or is this kilowatts or? or were you... oh, yeah, so, so um, there was a process last year through which uh, several designs were kind of tested in a, in, a, in, in a bit of a competitive format. Um, 
And, and the one we've settled on is to produce at least one kilowatt hour, um, okay. which is you know, one unit of electricity that you buy uh, at home in, uh, in less than 100 hours. So, so, so effectively 10 watts, something that produces 10 watts. Um, okay. That would be the, the scale that we're looking on. Um, and, and that allows you, I mean, that's high enough so that you can have an independent jury look at this and really establish that something is producing energy, which okay. is not the case for the milliwatt level. Uh, yet at the same time, you're not requiring megawatts, which you probably you know, wouldn't know what to do with anyway in a labor laboratory setting. So actually, I think smaller is better for these um, Okay, so 10 watts, 10 watts is of the order of uh, the, the power that's required to charge up your mobile phone. So what you're saying is I'd like a device which can charge up 100 mobile phones, one after the other, Right, or, or that one, kind yeah, of thing. For, for 100 hours, yes. yeah. yeah, something of, of that order. And, and then uh, the, the other part is um, that it's got to be something that works indoors, right? I think there are many technologies out there okay. that tap into the energy of the environment as we know it, right? Like, like PV panels, uh, wind turbines, and there's all kinds of technologies that work outdoors. What we're looking for is something that works indoors anywhere on earth um, and, and that implies that it can be tested in any laboratory on earth as well and that it might potentially have uh, applications for uh, for mobility yeah. so I'm thinking then you're looking at something being portable uh, reproducible uh, works over a, a period of time uh, yes and, and clean and clean and, which, which also displays a, um, a pathway to abundance. So, so, so it's no good if you're dependent on some very rare materials that we just know we don't have enough on Earth. Um, you, you have to have a plausible pathway for, for this technology to become a, a material energy source. And um, so who's going to fund this prize? Yes, well, I think this type of prize um, could appeal to philanthropies that value uh, what they call effective altruism, coupled with uh, a big bet approach. So effective altruism is about directing your resources at problems that, are, that have a high impact, uh, that are relatively neglected, and uh, that are tractable, right? Now, the impact of a fundamentally new energy source, if it were to be discovered, um, is, is hard to estimate, mm. but, but it could be very significant. The neglectedness of the field is, is I think, illustrated by, by the amount of funding that goes to researchers who are currently working beyond mm. these boundaries of accepted science. There's not a lot of funding available, very little public funding uh, and, and a few venture capitalists perhaps uh, th that are spreading a little bit of money in this field. And then the key question is attractability. Is, can you actually achieve something if, if you put some money against this, right? Right. And well, I'm, I'm personally, I, I think there's a small chance that the prize will actually be won but a decent chance, small but decent chance, is the way I would describe it. Um, and I think the interesting part of the prize approach is that, in a sense, you, it's a no cure, no pay, right? So the, the larger amount, and, and we're thinking of a, a $20 million total um, budget for this prize, the award you only need to pay if, if the prize is successfully claimed, i.e. if somebody actually finds this fundamental new energy source, which is vetted by an independent jury of science professors from around the world. Um, so in the end, what you, that commitment is relatively efficient compared to the benefits you get out of it. Not every philanthropy, uh, in fact, I think most not, uh, like taking high-risk approaches, right? Most, most um, philanthropic institutions prefer to fund 
things that are a little bit more in the in the mainstream where, where you don't have risk basically on, on the amounts that you commit. But there are a few uh, philanthropic institutions who have this big bet approach where they say, well, look, what, the, what these venture capitalists are doing in the for-profit scene, we could perhaps meaningfully replicate that in the non-profit scene and just place a few big bets on, on very unlikely technologies, accepting that they're, they're probably not going to yield anything, well, so, but, but we're but, doing it for those that will yield something. But, but 20, 20 million for a company like Shell is not a lot. So why wouldn't, if, if there was something to be gained out of putting that kind of money forward, why wouldn't Shell do it? Surely it would have been in, of, of interest to Shell if some really meaningful new energy source came up. Yeah, well, it, it's a good question. Um, so I think from my personal perspective, um, I think there's a large issue around trust. And I think you really need to think about the type of sponsor that you want for the prize compared to the type of inventor you want to attract to your prize. So what kind of inventor do you want to well, attract? Well, you know, sometimes, so some inventors are, 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 you know, regular scientists, probably with a bit of a rebellious streak, uh, so to speak. And, and um, well, you talked about cold fusion uh, um, earlier on. You know, in Japan, they've got a pretty, I'd, I'd say, institutionalized approach to cold fusion research. It's, it's pretty thinly funded, but, you know, it's professors working in different universities, collaborating just as any other subject, really. Um, but you also have uh, inventors who come from outside even the, the, the scientific domain, right? Um, and an interesting example is, for example, the, the Longitude Prize, mm. where 300 years ago, um, one of the grand challenges of society at the time was, was determining the east-west position of a ship on the globe. It was a difficult problem, apparently. And, and the UK government, three centuries ago, used this prize mechanism to get original solutions to, you know, uh, that would allow their captains to determine their position at sea and, and avoid wreckage. And they thought it would be won by some very smart astronomer through exquisite celestial observations and some very advanced mathematics determining where you are. But the person who won that prize was a carpenter. It was a complete surprise. Um, I forget the name. I think it's... Harrison. Harrison. Oh, you all know this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and, and he won the prize uh, with, uh, by making a good watch. He was a part-time watchmaker. And, and he made a watch that would work at sea despite all the movements of, uh, of the ship. And, and so that's someone that you reach with a prize that you would never reach through funding, right? But there's more to the trust issue, which is... How would you feel if you had invented something that, that was basically, you know, a new source of energy? Well, Think about it'd be it. great. I mean... Think about it. Would, would, you, would you go to, a, you know, an oil company and say, hey, look, I've invented something that's fantastic that can save the world. Would you feel good about it? Or would you say, well, you know, I'm, I'd like to keep some of this to myself. And I think there's a lot of of psychology involved there, and, and you need to build trust. So the innovators that come to you need to have a level of trust in the jury uh, that they can give insight into what they have developed and, and not ha losing their, their intellectual property rights. But isn't there a, a, a question of the, the entry level of technology that you're going to need to come up with something that other people haven't come up with. I mean, to, to venture into the technologies of, say, cold fusion requires a bit more skill than perhaps your, your average technologist might have. Or do you have to stand on the shoulders of other people to do this? Look, or is this... Look, 99% uh, yes. 
one percent? Maybe not. And that's, that's the, the example of, of, of John Harrison, isn't it? Um, th there was also this absolutely fascinating example in um, in the United Kingdom uh, of a gentleman called Morris Ward. I don't know if you've heard of him, and and he invented some spectacular coating material. Um, th there's a series on him on the BBC Reel at the moment. They 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 went back into their archives uh, because this gentleman presented a test on tomorrow's world, which apparently is a, is a thing here in the UK. And, and they showed um, an egg in a blowtorch. It exploded. And then an egg in a blowtorch with this material, and it, it withstood you know, the blowtorch for five minutes, and then they broke the egg, it wasn't even boiled. So it was an extraordinary material. The inventor was a lady's hairdresser. Yeah, I can't explain it. Okay. Uh, but but, but I, I think the point is that sometimes very innovative things can come from outside of the um, established circles. So uh, more, more likely, they come from within. So where, I mean, so, so where is this material, that the egg coating material now, and what is it used for? Well, it's an interesting point. So um, and was that something that has now become well established and lots of other people have reproduced it and it's it's a thing that we all use uh, uh, I, 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 that's an interesting one to follow up i feel as if one important thing about this prize is that you have an idea you create something which does it produces a little bit of energy and it's it's open then for other people to to exploit, or do you do you keep the rights of this? I mean, I, how does it get how does it get reproduced and tested by other people that, that, without you losing ownership of it? Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, it, in the case of this material, the gentleman died with his secret. Um, he was never able to share it because okay. he was never able to come to any commercial terms with anybody in the world. Perhaps had there been a prize, right, it would have been a different story, a non with, without a, any profit motive. It might have ended differently. I think for this energy prize to work, uh, you're completely right. You can't have anyone coming in, showing something, and then walking away and with a prize, and the world is no better place for it. That doesn't make sense. Um, so, so I think, first of all, we'd, we'd look at replication as, as a, a necessary condition uh, to win the prize. So it, it will be in, in several phases, and, and the last of which is replication by an independent third party, which might be the jury members or, 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 or any other third party, so that you're sure that you test your devices against the highest level of scientific authority possible, which is you know, independent replication, right? And yeah, perhaps certain agreements need to be made around IP as well to, to, to ensure that the, the prize then actually goes on to mean something for the world, yes. So what's the time scale for, for setting up this prize? Well, uh, look, we're in the very early uh, uh, stages, but <clears throat> I think that could go fairly, fairly rapidly. You'd need at least a year and a half to actually uh, properly set it up. But really what we're doing right now is just looking for partners, um, both in terms of uh, people who might want to support the prize uh, from the academic world, um, as well as um, philanthropies who, who might be interested in, in sponsoring the development and, and later the actual launch of the prize. And, and who would you expect? Have you got any expectations as to who would, who would enter the competition? Would it be young people, old people, companies, individuals, or is that really, you just don't know? Uh, yeah, the, the idea is to reward technology irrespective of, 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 the, um, of the entrant, right? But what you would hope is that you get, um, you motivate people who are already working in this field today, because there are a few people working in this field today, that, that you would motivate them to focus on building something that meets the criteria of the prize. Um, but at the same time, it might also be an inspiration to attract a new generation of people, you're quite right. Um, 
people have perhaps had ideas about new energy sources or, or scientists who have observed phenomenon that, that they've always kind of pushed aside and, and for whom a, a prize might be a trigger to, to think about some of the things they've seen and, and, and actually try and, and do some more research in that field. So I wonder whether the prize needs to have kind of a, a, a process whereby people who've got good ideas but don't have the, the technologies available to them to test those ideas out. So where you want to be able to say, well, look, I, I, I've, I've been thinking about this little twist on right, this technology, yeah. and I can't do this. I don't have the facilities to do it, but I would like to, to have a forum where I could talk about my idea, but it's not in the position where it's going to fit the criteria of the prize. So you, surely you'd need to have a way of, of allowing people to enter with kind of yeah. poorly formed ideas and that is going to give somebody a, oh gosh, hadn't thought about that, yes I can use that idea and then out comes something useful. I, I suppose, you know, to, to some extent that type of discussion is, is, is indeed something you'd want to generate. Um, I, I think for the prize you constantly have to balance between your, your open mind and your feet on the ground. Mm. Uh, and, and the way I envisage it is to have a very low entry hurdle, so indeed anyone with, with a, a prototype they think is working can, can enter. Uh, this authoritative exit hurdle, uh, as I mentioned, so that when you award a prize you're sure that you have something that, that actually works. But in between you need a pretty efficient process as well. And um, I think there is wheat and chaff mm. that um, you, you have to be pretty rigorous about, otherwise you will strand you know, in, in, in pursuing too many uh, yeah. different avenues, if you see what I mean. So, so, so I think it's, it's fair to ask any participant who would, would like to enter, is, is for them to, to seek some um, you know, supporting ecosystem if they need it, and then with that uh, come to the prize. Which generally is, is, is the way these prizes work, by the way. So if, if you look at um, the original X Prize, right, the Ansari X Prize mm. about um, private uh, manned space flight, mm. uh, the prize was only 10 million, but it, it motivated about 100 million of research and development costs, right? So, so, so it, it, there's a, this leverage effect yeah. between the prize that you're putting in and, and the money that others are putting in, in perhaps investors, uh, in, in working to vie for that prize. So we have in the room here some people who work in, in various technologies and perhaps people who are interested in various technologies. Um, and we also have some uh, 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 young people in the room who are from one of our local schools. Um, and I know they have to leave uh, reasonably soon, so I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody got an opportunity to answer some, answer some questions. Are you willing to take questions from the floor? Yeah, if they're not too difficult. Yeah. Those, if they're not too difficult. So we have not too difficult questions. Um, Sophie over there has got a microphone, so if you'd like to, we've got a question right up the back there, we'll start there, um, and if you'd like to ask questions to, uh, to Joris, then we'll, we'll go. Sorry. Hi, uh, um, not sure if I can keep within the confines of not being difficult, but um, <laughs> that's not usually what I do. Um, so thank you very much, it's been really interesting to hear about this proposed prize. Um, one of the potential dangers that I see is that by kind of focusing on this idea of miracle energy that might come in the future, we don't take the, ne the very necessary steps that we need to do now to stop using oil, gas and coal. So, for example, we know that we've got to at least half emissions and ideally stop emissions within 12 years. And surely mobilizing a lot of the resources that we currently have um, in terms of energy production, but also in terms of reducing consumption, looking at alternative economic models to try and reduce our dependence on growth, are very necessary things that we need to do in a very, very short time frame. Um, and that perhaps there's some 
danger of relying on future technologies which might swoop down and save us. Um, for example, like carbon capture, which is being proposed a lot um, as ways to, you know, to get within a pathway, but we don't necessarily have the technology to, to do it yet. Um, so I guess my question is, how do, you, how do you reconcile future technologies with the kind of perhaps more mundane and difficult decisions we need to make now? Yeah, the, thank you. I think that's a very valid um, concern. So from, from my perspective, um, the, the rational thing to do for society because of the urgency of climate change is to roll out what we have today as soon as we can, which is what we're really <coughs> trying to do globally. And, and to put that into perspective, uh, you know, there are tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions, going into those efforts. Um, new uh, technology development as, as a field uh, is, can only be a complement to, to, to what we have to roll out today. So it wouldn't be sensible to, um, you know, to, to put all your hopes on a, on a miracle energy prize. I'm, I'm fully with you on that. But the reverse is also true in my, in my perspective, which is if you completely exclude any um, funding of new energy technology, then perhaps you miss out on some important things. Um, <coughs> And I think we're, we're in a hurry, and to come back to the cold fusion example, um, you know, perhaps we will work it out at the end of the century, but we need it now, right? So I think if with a you know, relatively small lever, you, you can help bring things forward, that, that could be quite um, attractive. And I also think it, it, it's, good to highlight perhaps the, um, the, the difference of, of potential new energy sources to things that we know, which is some of these could be really, really low on the cost curve and, and could be quite compact without some of the um, inconveniences of, of, of other types of, of energy. So, so it might just be that you actually do find something that can swiften your, your transition because you find something that is not only cleaner than oil, but also more competitive than oil and more convenient than oil. And that's the type of thing that, that you would really want to, uh, want, want to search for. But by all means, let's not stop uh, you know, what we're doing in, that, in terms of rollout of traditional... I think one of the criticisms of this recent IPCC report is that uh, there is a lot of emphasis on carbon capture and storage, on negative emissions technologies, on bioenergy, BEX, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, direct air capture of CO2 from the air. Um, and, um, and, and these are seen as being uh, what are called mitigation deterrents. So that because these technologies are being talked about and hyped up, that, that they are indeed putting us off from doing what we have to do, which is to reduce our fossil fuel emissions. So that's, that yes, I think yeah. is the same, the same thing. There's, these, these things, mitigation deterrence. And, and I think we've got to be absolutely clear that, as you said you know, right early on, the one thing that we're not doing at the moment is you know, we haven't reached peak fossil fuel yet. No, um, no, no, no. And do you think, do you, do you really honestly think that an X Prize will help us to, to, to turn that curve or do, or do, we, yeah, do well, we need something else? Look, I just want to build one, one more on that. Um, I, I, I suppose you're a little bit used to, to that argument because you, you, you take an interest in um, geoengineering, I understand. I do, right? but that's... Yes. And, and, and that's the, another mitigation deterrent. Right, so that's another one of these issues where you say, well, look, if you, if you can have a quick fix on solar radiation, mm. then people are not, not going to do anything. Yeah, but my uh, argument would so, be... So that's a, uh, you know, but, but a valid say, concern. I would I, say that you, 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 can't, you can't say to someone who, who's a heavy smoker that, you know, we'll give you a lung transplant. You've got to say, we'll give you a lung transplant, but you've got to stop smoking. So yes, we can yeah, do yeah. any of these things, but we've got to stop burning fossil fuels. In, in my book... Um, you know, 
some revolutionary new energy technology comes before geoengineering, uh, or, or perhaps in parallel. But but th that seems more benign to me. Um, but it's in the but same the, ballpark. The it, right? it, you, you don't want to stop doing what you have to do today. Yeah. But let's develop the technologies of tomorrow. Um, but it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to be incentivized because it's going to be really difficult for us to stop burning fossil fuels. Yeah. And if these miracle technologies don't appear, um, well, we've still got to have been stopping burning fossil fuels. Of course, and that's where we are today. Uh, we also see that the negotiations are sometimes difficult, and, and you know, different um, parties uh, are, are pulling out of agreements, mm. and, and, and the parties in the agreements actually don't add up to, to what they've agreed to. Uh, so, so it's going to be a very difficult uh, process going forward. So let's do an all of the above approach. Right? Yeah. So other questions here. Good question up the front. There's a microphone coming in, so we can all. We'll hear clearly. It, no, but it's, 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 we're recording okay, this. So I'll, I'll just speak anyway. So I just want to say thank you very no, much. Can you use the microphone because we are recording this. So, so thank you very much for speaking. Um, I just wanted to um, go into a point that was sort of maybe alluded to a little bit is if a company like Shell were financing some, a prize like this, were you sort of implying that they wouldn't be trusted with the technology that might be discovered? Would they perhaps bury it because it's something that basically threatens their whole business plan? Look, I, I, sorry I, to be so blunt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, or Shell or any other company. Yeah, or any other company. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I, I think um, so. So I've I've worked for the company, and 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 really, um, I, I think they're an excellent company in what they do. Um, but but I, you know, you you also just have to recognise um, that, that sometimes conflicting. <coughs> interests right between companies and and, and innovations um, uh, people sometimes use a uh, kodak as an example right is uh, if only kodak had jumped on the on the digital camera um, but their dna was just selling these films so so it had to come from outside and and maybe something similar is true between the traditional energy industry and and you know these new initiatives um, I've, I've also heard, you know, people suggest, well, why don't you get some oil shake to, to fund this prize? Or, and, and I think we need to be very careful in, in, in which type of um, funding you attract for a prize in order to, for it to work, right? So supposing you got a, an unmarked envelope with 20 million in it, and it said, yours, here's the money for your prize. And you don't know where it's come from. Ah. <laughs> Would you, do you take the money? Look, uh, if I might, don't know where and then you discover from. later on that it comes from you know, from where? Uh, no, I, I, I suppose I would, yes, because I, th I think you know organizing the prize is more important than okay. uh, than, than not. Uh, but, I mean, if, if somebody gives you an unmarked envelope, it, it also assumes that you know they won't have anything to say about what you're actually um, how you're organizing your prize, right? No, so they might not have anything to say about how you're organising a prize, but once the prize has been given and they say, oh, well, look, we're very proud to have supported this, and we know, are ExxonMobil, uh, yeah, does that change? The no, it's not necessarily a problem, I think, no. no. But that's the kind of question you're asking, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, but I just have one more point. Do you have any knowledge of any alternative technologies that have been affected or buried by oil companies or companies like that? So the question was, do you have any knowledge of, of sorry, So, in, uh, do you know of anything, any any alternative technologies that has been that have been buried by um, by the fossil fuel industry? Uh, no, on, honestly, I, I, I don't. Um, and and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 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 not in general so much into conspiracy theories, but I think it's a valid concern from a from a certain perspective. I, I just, you know, I, I haven't taken a particular interest in in, in answering those questions. And, and I think my reservation was also more, um, you know, it's, it's maybe about bearing, but it's also about competing, right? Uh, people also need to be able to trust that, that whoever's sponsoring the prize, you know, is not going to 
compete and, and actually bring it to market, mm. but, but just you know compete with the original invention. But there are there are plenty of instances through the patent system where companies buy up a patent and then sit on it. So what's to say that doesn't happen in the fossil fuel industry? Perhaps it does. Yeah. So okay, other questions. So yes. So, so if you're um, concerned about, if the prize is to prevent the, consump the burning of additional fossil fuel and the emissions that are causing the climate crisis, could, you, could the prize also be awarded to somebody who sort of provided the, uh, the antimatter to that? You know, so if there was a miracle carbon capture method, mechanism, that you could, uh, which you could easily, you know, uh, Calibrate in terms of the same yeah. kilowatt, right? Would that would that be a? Is it possible to make the prize you know switch, play to both sides of the coin? Right. I mean, I think yeah. that, that one, oh, you, yeah. one one possibility that that's been mentioned in the carbon capture world is, if you had a a new process which would could could convert CO two into some solid, nice and easily, then it would make it much easier to capture. Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. Um, it, it came up actually la last year as we were, you know, working uh, with a pretty diverse group on, on uh, defining this prize, what it should all, uh, all be about. And, and one of the comments was, was, was just that, right? Is um, should we have a prize to, to actually, you know, capture carbon in a very efficient way from the atmosphere? And and I think I think we do. We need two prizes, but one already exists. The Virgin Earth Challenge by Richard Branson is exactly that. It awards $25 million for technology that captures CO2 from the air. Or maybe you know more about Well, well I know there. about the Richard yes. Branson's prize because so I've, I've spoken not, to him yeah. about it. The, the problem is his, uh, his criteria to award the prize, right, is that the, the, uh, the winner of the prize has to prove their technology works by by proving that they've sold roughly 10 times the value of the prize in the carbon offsets. So his $20 million prize, the proof, to win the prize, you have, to, you have to produce a carbon reduction that's equal to $200 million worth of carbon product, right? right? Yeah. So nobody's, nobody, nobody really with the methods to do that has bought that story, right? Yeah. So R Richard's a good PR man, but that, that proved to be not a very effective prize, right? Right, well, well, I think that's an important point, is, is um, how do you actually organize the prize and what are the details, rules, of course, that you put around this prize? I, I do believe that it's a prize, you need to do it properly or, or it will not work simply. So one of the issues with that prize is that we're currently globally producing 30 or 40 billion tonnes of CO2 per year through the burning of fossil fuels. And to have any impact on on climate change through carbon capture. You've got to be thinking of capturing of the order of a few billion tonnes a year of CO2. Now, whatever technology you come up with has got to be on that, that kind of, it's got to be scalable to that kind of scale or else it's not really worth doing. So your X prize for energy, you also have to have a, a a scale up ability element to it. It's got to be, it's all very well to be able to produce, uh, you know, 10 watts over, a, over a, a few hundred hours, but can this be scaled up? Would that be an element of, a necessary element of the prize? Uh, yes, I, I think there's two aspects to, to that. Uh, thank you. Um, in some, in, from some perspectives, scaling down is more of a problem than scaling up. Um, especially if you look at the fusion type solutions, right? Mm. The reason we don't have hydrogen fusion is because we can only do it as a bomb. Um, the problem is, you know, controlling it and, and preferably getting it small. And I, I used to live next to this reactor they're building in the south of France. It, it's very big, um, even though they only have like three grams of hydrogen, you know, it, it's like Hmm. I don't know, a couple of square kilometers of mountain top that they removed to, to build that site. And it's, it, you know, it's taking tens of billions and, and you know, multiple decades to build it. So, so from some perspective, small is beautiful. You're right about scaling up. And, and this is perhaps where um, 
I, I can um, reflect back on uh, Professor David Mackay's book, right? Um, he, he wrote about how s the, the potential of sustainable energy for the UK mm -hmm. in particular, and, and he stacked up like all the energy uses and then you know, all the energy supply options for the UK, like uh, you know, windmills everywhere and, and solar panels in between the windmills and, and biofuels and you know, all the roofs, and, and they just barely mm. meet. But he says on, on page 173 of his book, uh, Sustainable Energy Without Hot Air, he says, you know, I think it's reckless to assume that we ever will crack the nut, but if we crack the nut of hydrogen fusion, uh, specifically DD fusion, um, we'd have some very good news. And, and I took that to be a, a British mm. expression. Because <laughs> with these bar charts, fusion, the, the potential is, is like yeah, this has. big. So, so I think there are technologies that you could scale up enormously and, and that could really make a big difference. It's not the case for every technology, but, but specifically well, the, the fusion thing. type technologies, yes. The good thing about fusion is that you can you can envisage scaling that up, but solar power, well, we're limited to however many watts per square meter that the sun shines on the earth, and, exactly, and yeah. we can't scale it up by a factor of a thousand. So, so other questions from the, oh, so, Martin, in there, yeah. Or if you can use the microphone, Sorry. please, then, yeah. just there, just there. Um, just two comments. First, um, in specifying the rules for the prize, um, I think it's good to follow the example of the original prize and have a very clear-cut objective criterion what needs to be done uh, and uh, in terms of the amount of energy per gram or something like that that's one thing but also to follow up the other questions um, there may be a very long time lag between uh, uh, the prototype and something which is scalable and something which is cheap because it seems to me that what we really want and what we need if we want to deal with climate change is um, to bring down the cost of some kind of renewables to be equivalent to the cost of coal, so that the Indians can afford to leapfrog directly to clean energy. And uh, that's going to take quite a long time for any technology, and for a very novel and exotic one, probably even longer. So probably one has to separate out the um, goals of just trying to find some clever new idea like coal fusion, and show it works on a tiny scale, and doing the kind of uh, thing that will actually help to prevent CO2 leading to a temperature rise of more than two degrees. I think they're two separate issues, and I think the first is clearly something which is uh, suitable for a prize. The second one is not so clear, because you can't really predict now how quickly something will become economically competitive with coal. Yes, I don't know if you would agree with those comments. Yeah, th th thank, you, thank you for those comments. Um, it, you know, it, indeed, the, the prize will, will not be about how quickly can you, you know, come into the market. Though so the prize is really about coming up with a working prototype, and I think the interesting thing is that it's it's really a science breakthrough prize. If you look at, at many um, uh, initiatives in the fusion space today, right, but which, which of course is an is an excellent example of you know, having a long way to go on the cost curve, right? There are many private fusion initiatives today, um, but they, they all um, innovate on what I'd call the technology dimension. So, so being smarter about, you know, making smaller reactors and, and things like that. What we're looking for is innovation on the science direction. And the idea is that perhaps if you really have a scientific breakthrough, you know, something that is just such an order, a different order of magnitude of technology, which cold fusion would be, uh, possibly, you know, we don't know everything about cold fusion yet, um, th then you have a certain chance of finding something that, that, that might perhaps be quicker than we imagine today. But in general, uh, I agree with your comment. Uh, I mean, from prototype to something on the market to you know, widespread adoption is, is, is a long journey, yes. So we've got a question here from the, uh, the school. 
Um, so I'd be quite concerned about the military applications and the dangers surrounding this um, ludicrously capable energy source. I mean, it's great saving the world, but if we're going to blow everything up anyway, then that's not ideal. But then also there's something, um, not really to get into politics, but um, if, um, for example, if somebody were to create um, such a capable energy source, there it's very possible that governments would be trying to silence them. It's already happening. Um, so, for example, a lot of um, sustainability-based companies in America um, have neglected to talk about the meat industry because that is America's biggest export. They're not allowed to talk about it. Right. If this happens, the same thing. I mean, think about there are other countries that are, we already know practice unethical um, practices um, when people don't go their way. So... Mm. Yes, well, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, and I think you're, you're very right to, to point that out. Um, the, the way I view this is probably these energy sources, if they are out there, w will be discovered one day, sooner or later. And we will face the negative, potential negative consequences uh, uh, of such new energy technology um, w when it is discovered. We'll have the positives and the negatives. Um, the reason I prefer sooner is climate change. So, so, so that's my reasoning. But I'm, I'm, I'm also hoping that Professor Price can, can help in, in kind of addressing the philosophical aspe aspects of, you know, whether it's even a good idea that, you know, we as... Uh, as mankind have access to even more, ever more energy because our, our track record in you know, using such energy responsibly you know, hasn't been um, exclusively positive. Yes, I suppose that's true. I mean, I, it, it's about our, our getting down to trust again. That you know, whoever is in charge of this energy, I mean, do, we, do, we, do we trust them? Um, and I suppose we've had we've had a long period of of not of not trusting people. Um, so we've got to, that, that that I guess has got to be fixed. Yeah, but at the same time, if if you look at the type, I mean, you you can design your your competition to to select for for certain types of of energy devices that you'd be looking for. And I think the general trend has been to decentralization, right? So. Somebody having solar panels on their roof, uh, you know, there's no matter of trust. I mean, they're just kind mm. of a autonomous, and, and you you you're weaned off a central energy supply system, <coughs> and and I think that trend will will continue. And this energy price is in that trend. You know, we're, we're not really looking for the next mega power plant which is centralized, but but we're more on the what, what Avery Lovins called uh, the soft energy path, right? So, so the path of distributed uh, types of energy. But it's got to be—it's got to be—it's got to make an impact sufficiently large to for us to for it to cause us to stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, yeah. one of David Mackay's right. things is he said, you know, every every little bit counts, but only a little. Um, you know, it's got to be—it's got to be—it's got to be big enough to make an impact. Yes, but what what. Um, Lovin's point was was that it can be much more effective to replicate many small devices rather than having one large device. And I think he used the car engine as an example. Mm. And, and he compared the cost of the car engine to the cost of a centralized power plant, you know, the, the, the turbines that are in there. Mm. And actually the car engine is, is way cheaper. And if you add up all the cars in the world, it's as much as the power plants. That's not the issue. Yes, but it's taken but several... Because you're doing many small things. It's taken several decades to develop uh, car engines to be you know, as, 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 as useful and productive as they are. And getting back to, to Martin's point, I mean, we, 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 read, we need yeah. solutions in the next one decade, not yeah. the next well, ten. Well, the, so. That is the premise of, of, of the prize. So the prize really needs to, to facilitate... Well, the simplicity, I guess, is what you... Simplicity, yes, and, and small is beautiful. Uh, okay. I'd, I'd say simple and, and, and small. Um, another aspect is, uh, perhaps it's good to just put that in for the moment, 
is uh, I think it should be an energy source that doesn't leave radioactive waste. Mm. Um, because anything that leaves radioactive waste will have a huge problem of adoption in society. Well, I suppose in general, an energy source that is environmentally... Uh, yeah, no emissions, yeah. no radioactive waste. So, those are mm. so actually follows on quite well. I was going to ask, are there any criteria around, for example, environmental impact or the potential energy return investment? And I feel compelled to add just a quick comment as well because I feel like there were some mischaracterizations of renewable energy and the potential energy transition. So, in first of all, the reason we aren't transitioning away from fossil fuel at this stage and phasing out coal-fired power stations isn't a deal with the economics. It's a political problem. I mean, ultimately, right now in Australia, new built solar is far, far cheaper than coal, and yet the government's trying to subsidise new coal-fired power stations. This is true of many countries as well. On top of that, in terms of Moore's law, you'll find it actually does apply when it comes to energy density, for example, in batteries as well as solar, and it's different to talk about Moore's law in relation to upscaling. You're talking more about economies of scale there. And we actually have seen that when it comes to solar. And in terms of portability, I mean, if you look at batteries, right now, at least in terms of lifetime costs, electric vehicles will be cheaper. And the IA predicts that in general, it will be cheaper by 2021, 2022. And generally, the IEA is actually in pretty conservative estimates as well. So I think I agree with the premise that we should be aiming for miracle technologies, of course. But we should be doing as a complement for renewable energy rather than as the way you framed it, which is more kind of like, we don't have the ability to actually do a proper energy transition, and so hence we have to turn to mir miracle energy, because that's just simply not true. Right, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry if I gave that impression. I, no, I, I do think it's complementary to what we're doing um, today. I, I think there are s some concerns as to material use for, for the renewable infrastructure that, that, that you mentioned, um, you know, whether we have with today's technology in batteries, for example, whether you have enough, and, and I, I drive an electric car, I'm, I'm, you know, I think it's a great um, invention, uh, but will you be able to scale that up to a billion cars with, with, with you know, the current reserves of, of rare metals that you have? These cars are, are pretty heavy, generally. Um, so, so we need ongoing uh, innovation also in that field. I'm not saying it won't be there, I think it will, um, but it's just going to take time. But David Mackay would also say that on his stacking up these two different columns, the, this big column here is how much energy we use. Yes. And this bit here is how much we can produce by, by sustainable methods. And yeah, yeah, they're, they're a little bit closer if I remember. But, uh, but, but I mean, but, but, right, yeah. it's, we've, got to be, we've got to be pulling the, the, the tall how much we use column down, which may mean that rather than having as many electric cars in the future as we've got uh, petrol and diesel cars now, we perhaps we, we, we don't have cars in the future. Maybe we travel or less. less and we share cars and so. uh, I, I think the first thing is, is indeed um, you know really having a critical look at, at our energy needs at all right mm. uh, it's, it's, it's reducing energy yeah and whatever you do I won't start about Bitcoin but it's amazing mm. the mm. type of energy wasting schemes that, that we have the c capability to imagine mm. is, is just beyond me Uh, thanks, I enjoyed your talk. Um, for some of us in this room, I know for probably 30 years we've been hearing that there's going to be a technological fix to climate change, and it's, it just simply hasn't happened. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the demand side rather than the supply side, we know that if the 10% largest consumers would reduce their consumption to just the European average, that globally we would reduce the emissions by a third. Now that seems to me to be a big win, a big prize. What a prize to me should be going after that, as opposed to your prize, which it seems to me hangs out this carrot of um, nirvana, which uh, we know from the last 30 years, this technological fix isn't gonna happen. So let's just park that and let's concentrate instead on how we go about reducing our consumption. I think yes, that gets what? back to this, uh, this sort yeah, of mitigation thank deterrent you for that question. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not sure I completely agree that we, we would have to choose between one and, and the other. And I, I, uh, I mean, what, what I sense in your question is very little faith in the fact that the prize might be won, which, which I, I only agree with him. That seems to be very dangerous. It hangs out this idea that technology is going to solve it, and therefore we can 
we don't need to tackle the uh, consumption side. Yes, well, I, I, I understand the, the, the concern. Um, I, I just have a different view. I think we should be trying this because of its potential to help out. I, I think that, that, that's the, the bottom line. Which is not to say we shouldn't do all the other things, including you know, reducing energy use where, where, where we can. But I think that. But I, I fail to see how broadening the portfolio of energy choices is, is, is going to harm us from a climate perspective, at least. So long as we don't keep on putting up. Well, that's. And, that's, and I think the, the IPCC, right. this IPCC report is, a, is doing yet, yet more of this. Now, we'll, the technology will, will sort out our. The, the, the problem. It's yeah, well, well I, I, I suppose I'm, uh, I'm less of a technology Luddite, uh, in a sense. But, but what we'll look at what we have today is, is solar panels. I think they're great inventions. So somebody someday did the research you know, to um, allow us to enjoy solar panels today. So, so I, I, I don't mm. see how it would hurt to, to work on a new generation. No, it doesn't. I mean, I, mean I, I get the point that you're, you're, you're afraid that people will stop doing other things if we launch this prize. The, the to be is, the, is the one trillion dollar prize for all of the alternative measures, right? The ten million dollar prize is a very small sum compared to the trillion or the minute of the Paris Accord to all of the reduction in technology. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, yours, yours is a good idea. It's a tiny fraction. So John's got the microphone there. Yeah. Um, my initial reaction listening to this is that anybody who can crack clean energy, clean portable energy, and who doesn't mess up their patent applications is going to be so rich this prize is irrelevant. To do. So, I mean, wh what's this prize bringing to the, the system? Yes, it, it's, uh, thank you for, for, for that question. And, and I think um, in, in my discussions I've had with, with various people, that, that at some point you, you, you come to, to that point, right, which is... If you have this, you know, you can um, have all the money you want, uh, so, so what's your problem? Yet, I think there are situations in, in which people will have difficulty coming to any commercial agreement, and, and this is why I cited this example of, of Morris Ward. What if there were a Morris Ward with you know, not a new thermal coating, but with some revolutionary energy device, but just cannot come to any commercial terms with anyone, um, but might perhaps, you know, step into a prize like this and, and, and see that as a, as a way to, um, to share a technology with the world and, and still have some reward for it. So we're going to be winding up in a minute. I've got a question here and then another one over there. So, yeah. Uh, I I'm going to ask a difficult question. Um, you highlighted in your talk two prizes in particular. They're kind of the gold standards for prizes that work, the Longitude Prize and the SpaceX Prize. Of course, we all know that there's a great many prizes in, out there in, in history that didn't work. Um, some of them wasted the money of the people who put the money up because they ended up paying up for things they didn't get. Lots of others didn't do that, but they did end up wasting the time and energy and, and resources of good people who were trying to make a difference, put in a lot of work to something that never worked out and never got paid for it. Um, what I'd like to know is what did you learn from those prizes? What have you learned from the prizes that didn't work that's going to help you avoid the mistakes that they made, not just how you're going to replicate the, the small number of prizes that really did work? Yeah, I'd, I'd, thank you. I'd, I think that's um, um, a very relevant question. So I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with all the prizes, but I know some of them have indeed not worked. Um, sometimes prizes don't work because technology just moves faster than, than the prize. Um, th that would not be a bad outcome in, in, in this case. Um, it could well be that this particular prize is, is never claimed or, or, or not claimed within a, a, a suitable, um, you know, within a reasonable time frame. Um, but from there to saying, well, let's not even try it, to me it seems like a relatively small investment from the part of the global community uh, in, in solving what might be an important question. 
So, so it's just a risk reward thing. I can't say the prize will definitely work. It's probably more likely not to work than, than to work. But if it works, there may be a high upside. Um, one thing I learned from the cold fusion people is that one problem is uh, uh, not very much funding. Uh, uh, it's because it's a sensitive process. I, I know a person at uh, Bombay Atomic Research Center who said, oh, we, we're doing, as it happens, we're doing this kind of reaction uh, ourselves, and they tested it, and all their specimens produced a lot of energy, and then they got a new supply, and it stopped working. So the trouble is um, finding the precise conditions, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of funding. Yeah. In other words, yes, it, well, that it, yeah, and, yeah. and it can't be done for the order of 10 million. It needs, it needs a bigger... Right, yeah, so, so I'd be happy to launch a bigger prize if I can find a sponsor for a bigger prize. Um, but, uh, again, I think a prize is only a complementary instrument to direct funding of research, be it public or, or private. Um, well, so, indeed, many of their contestants will have to find their own funding to actually develop a device, that's true. So the prize, hopefully, will mobilize some of that extra research money. So I think we, we ought to, 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 to draw things to a close. With any luck, we'll have some refreshments in the, the room next door. Um, and uh, I'm, it, it's very interesting when we're talking about the very real and present problem of climate change in the context of things that are kind of not real and present and whether we can facilitate those kinds of things that we, we need to have in the future. Now, at the beginning of this talk, you, you, you look back at this blip of, uh -huh. the, of, of now we're in this fossil fuel blip. And I guess what we're hoping is that we, that will be followed by a long sustained future of something much more benign and, uh, and successful. So, um, look, thank you very much, Joris, for uh, having this discussion tonight. Uh, thank and, you. Um, thank you very much.